In a previous talk, we heard about how Auto DevOps makes it really simple to get up and running with minimal configuration, and it absolutely does. But your business and your team and your DevOps adoption in your company are going to grow and change, and it's important to be sure that your DevOps platform keeps pace with those changes. Now, growing and changing doesn't mean you have to throw out everything that's come before because GitLab is a true DevOps platform. It's not a collection of tools that you've stitched together to meet a very specific, narrowly constrained use case. So it will absolutely grow with you, but there are some best practices and how to evolve from auto DevOps to something that will grow with your use cases as they grow. To learn more about that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Marshall Cottrell to talk about his work for NASA and his experience evolving beyond auto DevOps to handle some increasingly complex Kubernetes deployments. Let's hear what he's learned. Hi guys, welcome to GitLab Commit Virtual. Thanks for joining this session. I'm gonna be talking about customizing auto DevOps and how we built a more extensible auto deploy stage uh, using Customize and Kept. My name is Marshall Cottrell. I'm the lead engineer of the platform team at MRI Technologies. MRI Technologies is a woman-owned small business uh, contractor. We do almost all of our work exclusively for NASA specifically. We're a 100% remote team, uh, rapidly growing, and we've always been evangelists of open source, repeatable deployments, uh, cloud native development practices, and we really take pride in our ability to um, modernize uh, software development within the agency. Before we dive into the technicals, uh, I wanted to give a bit of background on um, what we've been working on over the past couple of years. Um, so we've been primarily focused on developing this cloud native software platform that we call AppDat. Um, to give a bit of background on why we chose to build on top of Auto DevOps, um, we were very limited in, in funding initially. We started off with a 30K uh, grant proposal. Um, so with GitLab and, and Auto DevOps, we were able to really hit the ground running, demonstrate a lot of value, highlight a lot of the features of GitLab um, without having to do a bunch of custom development. Um, obviously, this talk is about how we have started to outgrow some of what's built into Auto DevOps, and so we'll get into that more in just a bit. Uh, so what makes our, our platform successful? Um, one of the core problems that we were trying to solve was the fact that NASA really had no way to manage uh, software deliverables. As a result of that, um, contractors generally perform all project and software um, project management using their own corporate systems and own corporate infrastructure. Um, in many ways, that actually benefits contractors particularly those that are large and well-established within the agency, um, because they're sort of able to silo all of this domain knowledge on how to build these systems, um, all the requirements gathering, all the issues and ticketing is all happening in their own systems. And so when you know a contract isn't, isn't going well, maybe it's over budget or um, you know taking too long to implement, NASA doesn't have a lot of options in terms of being able to maybe transition that project to a uh, another contractor or even bring it in house uh, on the civil side because you know NASA has never mandated that any of the deliverables outside of you know you know the the project being deployed to a production environment um, uh, be be part of the contract. And so that's really what we were trying to solve. We, we wanted a place where software could be um, continuously integrated and, and delivered onto one platform um, so that NASA could, could ensure that, that software contracts remain competitive, right? Everything's being done out in the open. Um, and uh, if NASA decides that, that they want somebody else working on the project, they can transfer all of that knowledge about how the project's been developed in the past um, to, to, to another uh, another contractor. So like I said, 
This has been a collaborative effort. There's no authoritative corporate ownership of the platform or operations. NASA owns the platform um, and NASA funds the platform. It's built entirely on open source software, so there's no vendor lock-in. There's no hidden cost to scaling. It's really easy to contribute to and extend individual pro uh, products. Um, we've exclusively focused on the cloud native aspect, uh, which allows us to avoid a lot of the complexity of, of doing anything on-premise or dealing with uh, NASA networking infrastructure. Um, as, a, as a result of that, we've, we've um, built it on, on zero trust principles. Um, which allows us to avoid the VPN. This has been really great um, uh, during COVID with everybody working from home. Um, you know, our, our, our systems aren't bogged down by, by how slow the NASA network can be during, during peak business hours. Um, we're able to deliver a, a, a really fast experience because we don't rely on um, traditional firewalls and stuff like that uh, for security. Um, everything runs on Kubernetes. That includes GitLab itself. We've been running GitLab on Kubernetes since the Helm chart was in, in alpha. We also run all of our customer workloads on Kubernetes, which allows us to operate a significant number of workloads at scale um, with a relatively small team. We don't have to have a lot of domain knowledge about how a bunch of different pieces are deployed independently because everything is generally deployed the exact same way. Um, one thing you might take for granted working in the private industry um, is the fact that we've vertically integrated pretty much everything from DNS, identity brokering, SAML provisioning, authentication and authorization, um, all that stuff that you know a, a typical software team in the private industry would have vertically integrated just by default. This is kind of unprecedented within NASA. Um, we, we've we've never had a a platform. Um, where one team can can do you know wildcard DNS provisioning uh, without you know going through some sort of like external ticketing system or something like that. Um, lastly, and, and arguably one of the most important pieces is that we've put a lot of emphasis on on changing culture and promoting collaboration, um, which is absolutely necessary. Uh, for for our customers to have success on the platform, right? If people aren't bought into the philosophy of of using a single tool for uh, integrating all their uh, software development, then it's it it wasn't going to work, right? Uh, so that was that was really big for us too. If you're interested in seeing or understanding more about the platform, uh, please check out our uh, 2019 Commit Brooklyn talk, uh, where I really dove deep in, into the business aspect and, and the, the platform side. Okay, so let's get into the technicals a little bit. Um, what is Auto DevOps? I think if you'll get a lot of different answers to this question, depending on who you ask, um, some, some responses are gonna tend to even be philosophical in nature. Um, but at the end of the day, this is what Auto DevOps is. It's a, it's a set of um, built-in CI templates that are composed together to, to give you what is referred to as the uh, auto DevOps pipeline. Um, it's, it's a bunch of sort of opinionated templates that just get you going. It's limited in the set of use cases it can support, um, but it does help you integrate um, the vast majority of, of the functionality that GitLab offers um, right out of the box. So let's focus on, on the auto deploy stage in particular. Uh, how, how does this piece work? Um, this YAML template is copied directly from the uh, GitLab source um, and, and is what's in that, that template um, that was referenced on the previous slide. So let's go through each step and, and kind of get a feel for what's going on here. Uh, the first step just checks to see that the um, environment variables, uh, the necessary environment variables are set in order for the CI job to be able to connect to the cluster in the first place. The second step uh, downloads uh, a, a third party external Helm chart if you have one specified. Otherwise, it just moves the um, built in chart to the appropriate directory uh, so that it can be um, deployed from in subsequent steps. Ensure namespace just ensures that the namespace exists. If you're using the GitLab uh, cluster integration, then this is done on the back end for you. And so this steps a no up. Um, otherwise, it'll, it'll create the namespace if, if it's not already uh, there. 
initialize tiller does nothing, just echoes that we're on Helm 3 now and til tiller's not being used. Uh, create secret creates a, um, a registry secret using kubectuddle, um, which is what uh, basically what the what you're going to set as the image pull credentials so that the cluster is able to download the image from the GitLab registry. And then finally, most of the complexity is implemented in the uh, deploy step here uh, at, at the end. And, and in, in the default implementation, that potentially does two, manages two separate uh, Helm releases, one for the Postgres chart to spin up an in-cluster database, and then another for um, uh, the application itself. Okay, so let's talk about um, our, our challenges with the auto deploy chart and what uh, led us down this path of, of needing more flexibility. Um, so the good news is that it works out of the box, right? If you are building a single container application um, and, and all you need is a deployment, a service, and an ingress, then uh, the auto deploy chart does, does what you need. And this is great because you don't have to write any code, you don't even really have to understand uh, much about Kubernetes for, for this to work um, for a small project. Uh, the other really nice thing is that you get integration with a bunch of GitLab functionality like deploy boards and pod logs. If you're not familiar with what some of this stuff is, um, the, the links are embedded in the presentation. So um, feel free to, to, to follow along if you're watching in real time. Um, it also has support for review apps, um, so those can get spun up and down dynamically. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, it, it has support for specifically a, a in-cluster PostgreSQL database uh, and, and also support for initialization and migration jobs, which is necessary to support uh, spinning up and tearing down review apps dynamically. Uh, so what's not so good? Like, what, what, what challenges do we have with the... Uh, default auto deploy implementation. First of all, it's it's fully imperative. Um, so it's very difficult to infer what deployments are going to look like prior to just running a full pipeline and looking at the state of the cluster after the fact. Um, it, it, it's really difficult to like test in isolation um, and and you, you know get 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 the the YAML that's that Helm is generating to, to kind of understand without doing a lot of work to um, fake a, a full-blown uh, auto-deploy pipeline. Um, it, it also has fairly opaque mechanisms for extensibility. Um, you have to understand a lot of the, of the details um, of how it works in order to be able to uh, override certain things. Uh, th this is kind of true of, of auto DevOps in general. Um, you know, like what environment variables can I set? What functionality is that going to override? Is this environment variable supposed to be set to the string little rule true, or like the setting uh, any non-empty string value trigger behavior? That that sort of stuff. Um, it's also not easy to just swap out the default chart. Um, you, you you don't get uh, integrations like the deploy boards and, and pod logs for free. You have to understand how those are implemented in the default chart and then implement that kind of stuff yourself in your own chart. Um, so th there's a big gap between going from everything built in to, to providing your own Helm chart. You basically have to understand how all the pieces work to, to, to be able to provide your own custom chart and still get the same sort of behaviors. Um, Along those same lines, there's no incremental upgrade paths from doing these imperative deployments to more declarative GitOps style deployments. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more uh, uh, in a bit. Uh, and it's also geared, like I said, exclusively towards single container application deployments. As soon as you want to compose multiple applications together um, or do anything more complex than a, uh, uh, a deployment and an ingress and a service, you you have to sort of jailbreak out of the entire thing. So I could spend uh, you know a whole talk going over the benefits of uh, declarative resource management. Um, if you're interested, in it, I'd encourage you to read um, the 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 full uh, post by by Brian Grant here. I have a link embedded in the slides. Um, but to to summarize, 
declarative resource management and version control is rapidly becoming the industry standard. Um, as your application grows more and more complex, uh, you'll reap more benefits out of uh, managing your application deployments declaratively. Um, and I think that like, as developers, we, we spend so much time automating processes in CI pipelines that it kind of feels funny and maybe a little counterintuitive to, to manage uh, Kubernetes YAML resources directly in a, in a Git repo. Um, but at the end of the day, you should, you should really be thinking about your resource manifests the same way you think about application code. Um, you want any changes to your Kubernetes deployments to be deliberate and reviewed by the same sort of um, uh, re merge request approval and review process uh, as application code. Uh, you know, for the same reasons that you don't want a, a third-party dependency being upgraded on an arbitrary deployment without uh, you know reviewing that explicitly, you don't want the the Helm chart that you're using to 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 um, change under the hood without you understanding the implications of that, right? I think another interesting point here um, that, that uh, Brian Grant was making is that despite the fact that, that Helm almost exclusively targets Kubernetes deployments as the, you know, the reason it exists, it, it doesn't really take advantage of that. It's not uh, intelligent or aware of, of the, the resources that, that are being templated. Um, Helm is perfectly happy for you to generate invalid YAML or um, resources that that don't align with the uh, Open API spec for um, or, sorry the, the the schema for for uh, that resource. Um, so it, it's not it, it's interesting that that we tend to use the same tool for both generating our configuration files and generating our Kubernetes uh, resource YAML, right? Um, you know, that's powerful, but it's, it's not always the right pr uh, approach. So just to give a bit of background, like, you know, what, what, what is imperative versus declarative, uh, to, to kind of help explain that I, I have some examples here towards the top are, are more imperative approaches to deployments. And then the, the, the bottom is, uh, leaning towards, uh, more, more declarative application management. Um, so, like I was saying, Helm, the, any sort of like templating uh, stuff like that, JSON it, um, doing arbitrary things or arbitrary setup and stuff in CI pipelines, that tends to be pretty imperative. Uh, Kubernetes itself is completely declarative, right? You you apply your resource YAML, um, that represents exactly what the cluster state is, and then Kubernetes does um, things like you know, you request a deployment with three replicas, and so it creates that deployment and then spins up three three pods to um, do do what you told it to do. That that's that's declarative application management. Um, so our experience has taught us, though, that uh, despite declarative man uh, application management being the preferred uh, way to go in the long run, that it's significantly easier to get started with an imperative, you know, CI. Uh, pipeline style deployment. Um, so we wanted to provide our users with a mechanism uh, that supported both use cases and and uh, provided relatively seamless upgrade paths um, towards declarative application management. We didn't want a tool that just did one or the other. Um, we we wanted something that would sort of um, shuttle you along through the evolution of your project. So what are our options for uh, uh, tooling, uh, if, if we want to take a more declarative approach. Um, there, there's two that we're going to talk about today, and these are, are the backbone uh, tooling that we're using in, in our auto deploy implementation. First of all, we have Customize, which allows us to um, uh, generate and, and apply patches to uh, Kubernetes resource manifests in, in a highly structured and, and, and programmatic way. Um, it's it's not possible to to generate um, invalid resources using customize, which is very different from Helm. There, there's no templating involved. Um, it, you can kind of think of customize as like a, 
a, a scalpel and, and helm is like a like a sledgehammer. You're you're making highly structured edits uh, to to Kubernetes resources and customize is aware of what those resources are um, and 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 what is valid and what is not valid. Um, they're also like a, a, another really important thing about customizations is that they're easily composable. Um, this is a huge advantage over Helm where the only way to compose multiple Helm chart deployments together is to write another Helm chart that wraps the other two Helm charts. Um, but even, even so, there's, there's no way to like share information between the two Helm charts. Like let's say that you have uh, two applications that you want to spin up and one of those applications needs to talk to a service um, that's being spun up by the other deployment. How do you get the the um, the the DNS name of the the service from package A and in, into package B, right? Because Helm Helm might be adding the release name, some prefixes, stuff like that. There's really no easy way to propagate uh, information from one Helm chart to another. Um, it, as we'll see, that's very easy to do and customize. Uh, and then we have kept, which is a Git native package manager for Kubernetes resources. Um, kept is is really awesome because it basically allows us to um, have these shared packages of Kubernetes resources and distribute them using nothing but Git. We don't need any like Helm, uh, Helm chart repository infrastructure. We don't need to host things or publish things to S3 buckets or GCS buckets. We can just use Git, which we're all already using anyway. So it's great to not have any extra infrastructure. Um, it also has next generation live commands for managing cluster resources. So similar to kubectl apply, we have live apply, um, which we'll, we'll get into the details of, of that and what the differences are. Uh, Kept always also allows us to make in-place edits to resources. Uh, and uh, again, we'll, we'll get into more of this uh, in, in the demo. Um, but one of the powerful features is this uh, three-way merge strategy where you can, you can pull a package from a remote Git repository, uh, make in-place edits to that package, and then later in, in like day two operations, you can update from the upstream remote and, and, and sort of rebase the changes that you made uh, on top of the, the upstream changes so that uh, by, by making these in-place edits, you're not like hard forking um, fr from the upstream. Well, it'll make more sense when we, when we get into the demo. So what were our goals with developing our own auto-deploy stage? Uh, well, we wanted a similar out-of-the-box experience uh, that the GitLab auto-deploy image provides, right? Uh, sometimes the, our, our customers don't really want to understand uh, how Kubernetes deployments work or anything like that. And they have very simple applications and we didn't want them to have to manage Kubernetes resources um, themselves if they didn't want to. So providing a similar out-of-the-box experience was goal number one. Um, but at the same time, we wanted seamless upgrade paths between using built-in packages that we might provide and customers that needed fully bespoke configurations. Um, we're also looking forward to, to using the GitLab Kubernetes agent. And so uh, we wanted to roll out something that, that would work against the legacy cluster integration, um, but have a seamless upgrade path as we migrate customers, customers over to the GitLab uh, uh, Kubernetes agent. And then we also wanted, um, you know, once we start adopting the, the in-cluster agent, um, we want to slowly be able to migrate people away from CI deployments to, to pure GitOps. And we don't want to have to have significant barriers to entry along all those upgrade paths. We want the, uh, the way you're managing things in your Git repo to, to stay relatively uh, the same across all these different use cases. That way, there's not like a lot of mental overhead, you know, at each step. Um, we also wanted to reduce the complexity uh, and improve the extensibility of the auto deploy stage, and and we did this by making things like in cluster databases uh, an application concern, right? Like if you need Postgres in the database, um, that's that's something that you can do in your own application. We don't need to have all these opinionated behaviors in, in, in auto deploy. Um, we can just focus on, on, on the, the core functionality. Uh, 
Um, like like I was hinting at before, we didn't want to have to maintain any any Helm charts or Helm chart repository infrastructure. Um, we just wanted something that would work with with just the Git repositories. And then uh, another thing that I've already kind kind of hinted at. Um, we wanted stuff like deploy boards and pod logs to just work, no matter if um, you're you're providing your own custom resources to deploy the cluster or you're using a, a, a built-in package that we provide. Um, so uh, an end user shouldn't have to know that the what what annotations need to be applied um, to their resources in order to get that sort of stuff to work. We wanted a mechanism by which we could apply those annotations on whatever resources they were providing. Um, without you know every every application every project having to having to do that and know about it. Okay, so how does the AppDat uh, implementation of the auto deploy stage work? Um, this this should look very similar to uh, the original auto deploy stage template that we looked at. It's uh, virtually the same. Um, it's mostly just the underlying implementation that's that's been swapped out that that allows us to do. Uh, a lot more cool stuff. Uh, I'm not going to go over it in too much detail. The, the gist of it is that um, we're, we're using Captain Customize under the hood, where we were using uh, Helm Helm releases before. So let's dig into some code. Um, to follow along, you'll need to get Customize and Captain's dependencies, uh, and then you can clone this repo um, to to follow follow along through the code examples. We'll start by looking at uh, customize and kept, uh, and then we'll kind of see how we incorporate these into the auto deploy stage. Okay, so uh, to get things going, I have this uh, CIML template um, to 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 uh, get things going quickly. Uh, we have the auto deploy stage implementation that we looked at already. Um, we're also going to be running K3s in, in the uh, uh, CI pipeline itself. Uh, rather than deploying to a remote cluster, um, everything would work exactly the same if you're using the, the GitLab cluster integration or um, the new GitLab Kubernetes agent uh, or bring your own kube config. Really, all you need is a kube config for any of this stuff to work. Um, so let's let's take a look at what's going on here. Um, similar to the default auto deploy implementation, um, where you can provide a custom Helm chart. Uh, in this case, we're just going to provide uh, a reference to this Git repository. So let's take a look at what that looks like on GitHub real quick. Um, so we can see there's this customized directory and then just a bunch of resource YAML. This one happens to have a customization YAML uh, too. That wouldn't be strictly necessary uh, for this example to work, but it does. That's that's great. Um, so let's hop over to our CI pipeline. I've already run this. Um, let's take a look at what was going on in here. So we deployed uh, Nginx to a cluster and we deployed pod info to a cluster. Um, let me scroll up to the top here. We can see uh, all these steps that we've talked about um, ha have, have been applied. We downloaded this remote package from the Git repository. Um, we, we ran these setters, like I said, setters are very powerful. You'll have to look into um, uh, that on your own. It's out of scope for this demo. Uh, Finally, deploy. This is where things get interesting. So we're using uh, kept live apply, uh, which is very similar to kubectl apply. The main differences are one um, that the uh, kept live apply performs status checks. Uh, it, it pulls the cluster. Um, so if you've done a kubectl apply and, and you know it, it sort of returns immediately, it just writes the cluster uh, the, the state to the cluster. Um, but it doesn't wait for your uh, your replicas to, to to be available, right? So we can see that before the process actually exited, it waited until um, all of our uh, pods were healthy and our deployment was uh, actually considered available. Um, the other thing, which is out of scope for this demo, is that uh, it supports pruning. So if I remove resources um, from from my Git repository and and they are um, they've been applied to the cluster. It keeps track of the inventory of what was applied previously and diffs that against what you're trying to apply now, and will actually prune those resources from the cluster um, so that stuff that is orphaned isn't just left out there. Um, so let's 
uh, look at one last thing here. Um, it, as you guys may know, the, the, the way that the pod logs and deploy boards work, the way GitLab is able to surface that information in the UI is by looking at these annotations on your deployments. Um, and so as you can see, we've taken these resources straight from a GitHub repository that we have no control over. Um, these annotations are not present in, 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 um, in the resource YAML here, but we've applied a customization on top of the customization that was provided to the end user, in this case, pod info. And so by doing that, we've been able to apply these annotations that GitLab needs um, without me as a user having to know that that's how it's implemented. So this is really powerful. That's what's powerful about Customize is that it allows us to compose customizations together to apply these sort of last mile changes on top of uh, what's been specified by the user. So let's take a look at uh, what like our day two operations might look like here. So let's say, for example, um, that we want to make some edits to these resources. We aren't quite happy with, with what they are by default. Um, we'll create a directory here called deploy. This is arbitrary. Uh, and then we'll do kept package get, and we'll write that to deploy pod info. Okay, great. So we have essentially just cloned this, this subdirectory of the Git repository. It has all the resources that we were just looking at. Um, and now we'll commit that. And then, like I said, we wanna make a small change here. We, we have two replicas here. Let's say that we want a minimum of three and a maximum of five. We'll commit that too. But, but then we've realized that uh, it turns out that the latest version of pod info is, is v6, and we're, we're on v5 now. But we've already made this in-place edit. Um, let's try to use kept to up, up, update that um, package for us. So we're going to run kept package update, uh, the path of the directory, the new version that we want, and then we're going to use this resource uh, merge strategy. So let's see what that does for us. OK, so as you can see, these in-place edits that we've made are still there. Um, and in addition to that, all the other edits, all the other changes that have taken place between v5 and v6 have also been applied. So essentially what Kept has done for us here is it's, it's um, taken the, the, the changes that we made, um, it, it's pulled in the upstream changes and then rebased the, the, the manual changes we made on, on top of that. It's called a, a, a three-way merge. And this is really powerful because it allows you to make trivial edits like that to your resources without having to write complicated uh, patches and customize or anything like that, but still ensure that you're uh, uh, tracking, tracking upstream changes, that you can still pull in um, uh, changes from the remote package um, and, and have your 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 edits your customization or your edits that you've made manually um, persist e even even across updates. So um, that's great. Uh, the the last thing we want to do here though is um, we'd really like to deploy all of these things together. Um, so let's go ahead and do. kpt package git and pull in the uh, nginx ingress controller. So now we can see we've got uh, ingress nginx and pod info. Additionally, um, we're going to uh, get into the deploy directory and do customize init. So this just gives us a bare bones customization. Um, what we want to do here is uh, add an 
and we'll add pod info as well. Um, the last thing is there'd be no point in using the uh, nginx ingress if we didn't actually have an ingress. So let's do uh, cube cuddle create to generate uh, an ingress resource for us here. Okay, the service, let's check the service name. Pod info, perfect. And then the last thing we need to do is actually add it to our customization YAML. Okay, looks good. Oh, one last thing. We need to uncomment this guy. And we will comment these out just to make our pipeline a little faster. Now let's take a look at our pipeline. And this is looking really good. So uh, what we've seen here is that Customize has allowed us to compose uh, two um, completely arbitrary uh, deployments. Um, in this case, we wanted to deploy the uh, Nginx ingress controller uh, as well as our application and then uh, deploy an ingress that's, that's using the uh, ingress controller. Um, we can see that that all worked fantastically. One thing that I wanted to point out, uh, some, uh, a, a cool thing that, that that Customize did for us there behind the scenes um, is that you'll notice that we're prefixing all these resources with uh, a name that is unique to our project. This is just an opinionated thing that we've done in our auto deploy implementation to make sure that uh, if you're deploying multiple applications to the same namespace that they don't conflict. Um, and, and in that case, that we had uh, where we had our, our service name here, and then we had our ingress that targets this service. Um, customize is, uh, you know, as, as distinct from Helm, um, Customize is aware of, of the resources and it, and it knows that if I change the name of, of um, the service here with a prefix or something, that any references to that service name should also be updated appropriately. So behind the scenes there, um, this, this service name reference would have been updated uh, to, to include the name prefix there automatically uh, for us as well. That kind of stuff is really handy with Customize and really makes um, it a lot easier to, to, to manage deployments and compose multiple deployments together. Just a lot less that you have to worry about. Okay, so that is, wraps it up for the demo. Last thing that I just wanted to go over is uh, the, the the bright future uh, ahead for uh, uh, GitLab's integration with Kubernetes. Uh, if you guys are not tracking the development of the GitLab Kubernetes agent, uh, you should be. It's a really exciting uh, uh, project that GitLab's working on. Finally, we have this in-cluster component um, as well as CAS. Uh, CAS is, is uh, the server-side implementation that, that facilitates all the communication between uh, Agent K, which is the in-cluster component, um, and, and GitLab. Uh, this allows us to implement all sorts of nice behaviors like, like having a caching layer so that GitLab isn't constantly pulling your clusters. It also allows you to integrate uh, clusters that may be behind a firewall or NAT, which is great um, for on-premise. Like You don't have to have um, your, your cluster endpoints publicly exposed anymore for uh, uh, a Kubernetes integration to work with GitLab. Um, so take a look at all these issues and proposals. These are things that we're particularly excited about. Uh, and and, and we really, the, the, the future is really bright for um, Kubernetes integration with GitLab. And then finally, uh, you know, YAML pipeline definitions have, have gotten us quite far. GitLab has also always had um, a really great uh, CICD tooling built in. Um, but you know, if we think about what the future of auto DevOps might look like, is that the ideal solution? Um, there's new projects coming out like Tecton, um, which allows you to basically have these declarative pipe, fully declarative pipeline definitions uh, that are that are Kubernetes native, 
uh, clearly the industry uh, is is headed towards um, buying in fully to, to Kubernetes. Uh, it, it's becoming the de facto standard for uh, uh, orchestrating applications and appliances and all sorts of stuff. Um, I, I think it makes sense for us to, to think about uh, where does GitLab fit in um, with 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 all these evolving technologies and and you know what 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 uh, what can we what can we learn from from projects like Tekton? So again, uh, lots of interesting proposals uh, around the future of auto DevOps, uh, the the future of compliance pipelines, and this one project that I wanted to call out. Uh, there's a proof of concept called Lab Flow. Um, it's basically like how how we might represent uh, uh, basically like lessons learned from 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 build tools like Basil and and whether it might make sense for us to have a a, a scripting engine um, built in built into runners to execute uh, uh, arbitrary code. That wraps it up. Uh, thank you for uh, attending my my uh, virtual presentation. Look forward to the Q and A.